Has that started, Emma? Yep, there it is. Yeah, that's started now. So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third in the Water Quality Improvement Plan seminar series. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the really important role that wetlands play in um, how we manage catchments, how we protect catchments to ensure a healthy reef, as well as the contribution of urban environments and what um, the role that the urban sector plays in making sure that that connection between catchment communities and the reef is protected, enhanced, improved. Uh, just before I kick off, um, just a recap on where we're at in terms of this conversation. We've had two seminars so far. So the first one, we gave you a, a big overview around the Reef 2050 plan and how it aims to address the key threats to the reef. We talked about how there is um, in the land side, there is two key documents that we work with. One is the Great Barrier Reef Wetlands strategy and the second one is the water quality improvement plan. Um, we also spoke about how there's a number of different pieces of the puzzle under review, including the targets. How do we want the urban sector to play a role in improving water quality and protecting the reef? Uh, the last seminar, sorry, we also spoke about the scope of the review of the water quality improvement plan, which is really around creating a more holistic and inclusive narrative. So how can we tell the story of, about catchments, communities, and that connection with the reef in a more holistic sense? Um, we spoke about creating a framework that is easier to understand and navigate so that um, when humans working under this framework that the government has created, um, they don't get lost within the, the many different plans and strategy, rather they really know what the objectives and outcomes that are trying to be achieved are. So today I have three amazing presenters for you. You're in for a real treat. We have Mike Ronan, who is the manager of the Wetlands Strategy. Uh, we have Jamie Cornfield, who is our urban expert in the Queensland government, and Meg Harlow, who is the urban expert in the federal government. And we work together. We spoke about the teamworks that is required to protecting the reef, but also to reviewing these frameworks. Um, we work together um, every day. I will also um, do an acknowledgement of country before I hand over to Mike. I am in Turbo and Yagara country, and I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where I am, of Mianjin. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the reef, and by reef I mean the land and the sea country. Um, I pay my respects to elders past and present. If you're a First Nations person joining us today, I pay my respects to you, your culture, your elders past and present. Um, and I think as we as we think about holistic holistic uh, management of of country of catchments, I really acknowledge and pay my respects to sixty five thousand years of caring for country in in a holistic and values-based sense. I think uh, the First Nations culture in this country is amazing and has built on that understanding and that management of country through, through time. And I'd like to thank them for sharing um, their journey and their values-based approach to protecting and caring for country. So with that, I am going to hand over to Mike Ronan, who will talk to us about the reef wetland strategy. Thanks very much, Maria. And thanks everybody for attending today. I'm looking forward to giving you a rundown on the reef 2050 wetland strategy. And I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, which we all meet. And again, acknowledging the tremendous connection they've had, the very holistic approach they've had to landscape and sea country, sky country, um, management uh, in millenn for millennia in the past. So 
I just want to run through what the wetland strategy is, how it came to be, what's in it, and its connections to the reefs. So, so basically, first of all, what is a, a wetland? Uh, they're, well, they're really the jewels in the crown, these stunning um, vegetated systems or, or swamps, uh, as some people might call them. We've also got our, our uh, beautiful lakes. Um, we've, uh, of course, rivers are all wetlands as well. And again, they come in all shapes and sizes, some of which are quite arid and sometimes don't have water in them, but they're still wetlands. Moving along. And of course, right down to much of the reef itself is a wetland. And uh, we've also got all of our estuarine areas and really stunning landscapes. Long. So basically, what are wetlands? Uh, put simply, they're really anything that gets wet long enough to have plants and animals or soil that are adapted to living in wet conditions. So billabongs, lakes, rivers, swamps, peat, uh, fens, peat, bogs, aquifers, and then of course the salty ones, so salt marshes, mangroves, corals, seagrass, and so on. They're all wetlands. So. The wetlands are located right throughout our catchments and right into the reef and really connect our entire system. They're a bit like the the, the blood system or the, nerve, the, the veins and that of the catchment. Um, and water isn't just the stuff that you see on the surface. Uh, you've got these recharge areas in the top of the catchment and throughout the catchment. So water goes underground. It then pops back out again as you get further down the catchment. And we break river um, wetlands into these systems like rivers, palestrine, lacustrine, estrine and marine systems. So they're right throughout the catchment and connect the entire catchment. So what's not a wetland is connected to a wetland in, in many ways. The other thing about wetlands is they've got a massive range of what are called intrinsic values and they also provide ecosystem services. So intrinsic values are the innate values of a wetland irrespective of whether people value them or not. And then the ecosystem services, which are the things they provide to us. So things like biodiversity and that would be intrinsic values. But then we've also got all of these services like uh, productivity, uh, fish, um, uh, aesthetics and cultural values as well. So they're, they're jam packed, uh, providing all of these values and services to us. But they're also under a lot of pressure. Uh, so pressure comes in lots of different forms. So weeds and invasive animals are, are uh, very, have a huge impact on the ability of wetlands to provide those intrinsic values and services to us. Land development, of course, uh, can have an impact. Irrigated agriculture, drainage in water extraction, excessive land use, runoff of nutrients, pesticides and sediments, altered fire regimes, pollutants, plastics and other rubbish. And of course, the exacer exacerbation of, of uh, impacts from climate change. Uh, so these are all kind of threats and pressures on our wetlands. So where does the Reef 2050 wetland strategy connect to the water quality improvement plan and the Reef 2050 plan itself? So you've got the long term sustainability plan and the traditional owner implementation plan. And, and then you've also got the Reef 2050 wetland strategy and the water quality improvement plan. I suppose the Reef 2050 wetland strategy focuses on two major things, which is system resilience and also water quality improvement. Uh, but then of course, the water quality improvement plan primarily focuses on the water quality aspects. So there is a little bit of uh, overlap at this point. Next slide. So where do we get our kind of need for this strategy? It's specifically picked up in the Reef 2050 Long Term Sustainability Plan. There's a requirement to review the previous uh, wetland strategy and to develop a new one. So we decided to do that. Next slide. 
So the, the updated strategy uh, was put in place after an evaluation of the original strategy that was in place and after extensive consultation. It was approved by the Australian and Queensland ministers, environment ministers, and released on the 2nd of February of this year. And its purpose is to improve wetlands management and alignment with uh, government, government initiatives, particularly the Reef 2050 plan. So it sits under that plan. It's branded as the same way. And I suppose if the picture on the front of it really demonstrates how hard wetlands work. Um, they're, they're embedded in landscapes and uh, I suppose are also part of the reef ecosystem. So the, the, the strategy or the structure of the Reef 2050 plan is that it's got a part A, B and C. Part A has the introduction and context, things like the purpose, the governance, the vision, the principles, the importance of wetlands and a very, very important bit, which is the mechanism for managing wetlands in this whole of system values based framework. Part B of the strategy deals with wetlands and treatment systems for water quality improvement. And then part C has the, I suppose, really the rubber hits the road. It's the teams, goals, objectives and activities. And there are 180 activities that are actually listed in the strategy uh, for implementation. And that's broken up under five themes, which is first of all, improving the wetlands information for decision making, wetland planning, on ground activities. Um, four is engagement, education, communication and capacity building. And theme five is monitoring, evaluation, reporting and improvement. Next slide. So the, uh, the vision for the strategy is that wetlands are managed throughout the reef and its catchment by a network of landholders, managers, traditional owners, custodians of country, scientists, government officials, industry and volunteers to maintain healthy, uh, sustainable healthy ecosystems, support ongoing production and prosperity, contribute to healthy communities and support the Great Barrier Reef to be a living natural and cultural wonder of the world. It's really important in this um, vision that you can see that people are not excluded. It's, it's not a kind of a keep wetlands all natural and, and uh, pristine and peaceful people out of them. It's very much a case of wise use, the concept of people being part of the landscape and overall having a healthy ecosystems and a healthy community uh, all, all working are working together. As I mentioned, um, the, the whole strategy is, is really based on this whole of system values based framework. And the concepts behind the whole of system values based framework is it's a management framework, but it draws explicit connections between the biophysical environment, we call them components and processes, and beneficiaries of the services provided by the ecosystems and their values. So uh, it, people are absolutely built into the system and it emphasizes that importance of involving people who value the system in planning and management. Um, it, it also adopts that approach of, of taking multiple scales. You, you can't really manage things at the kind of property scale. You have to actually be uh, considering the broader landscape uh, to make sure that your management activities work in, um, I suppose, uh, with the rest of the range of activities you've got at a catchment scale. And the aquatic ecosystem rehabilitation process is basically consistent with that whole of system values based framework and adopts those same principles. So the, the stages of the framework is, first of all, it's very difficult uh, to understand how you can manage a system if you don't understand how it works. So the stages are building that understanding of 
the landscape you're in, the catchment you're in, how it functions and how the activities that are occurring there, including the agricultural activities and urban activities, actually work within that landscape. You can then define objectives, determine the threats and pressures and come up with management intervention options. And there are six uh, themes of management intervention that can happen. Um, it's extremely important to implement this uh, structure, these stages that we have a number of supporting uh, pillars and they're the ones on the right hand side, which is synthesized science and research for knowledge gaps. So in other words, we don't just keep getting more and more science. The science should be synthesized in a way that people can understand it. Uh, monitoring, evaluation, reporting and improvement and uh, communication capacity building, education, participation and awareness. So they're the pillars that support the actual structure and the process uh, and the stages that are referred to here. Um, water processes in the landscape drive a significant amount of what we're talking about and it's essential that uh, they're understood when you're actually dealing with an area. So you need to know where water is recharged into groundwater, what are groundwater dependent ecosystems, where water is coming out from groundwater, how surface water is moving and how we've modified that in terms of wells and irrigation systems and so on and so forth. So this is, I suppose, the tapestry on which uh, the values based uh, framework applies. So you really need to understand this. So that's the overall framework and the overall strategy. But I want to specifically mention a few things about wetlands and water quality now for the last 10 minutes. Um, so we recommend, and it's always been part of the, the wetlands program, uh, taking a treatment train approach. So understanding that whole of system approach means that you manage the landscape first of all or manage within a landscape then you've got best management practice whether that's on farm or in the urban area you've got on farm treatment of um, any kind of uh, contaminants or urban water treatment and then once that's happened, you've managed to those three levels, then you can start looking at off farm or landscape or catchment treatment wetlands. And then finally, um, and this is definitely not something we'd re recommend as the first line of defense, you've got natural wetlands in the landscape that can actually remove certain amounts of contaminants as long as we, we take this treatment train approach. So a bit of work that's actually underway at the moment under the Reef 2050 wetland strategy or contributes to water quality. I just want to mention three major bits of work, uh, treatment systems and work that we're doing with DAF and other colleagues and nitrogen processes and water monitoring and then water modeling, including conceptual models. So there's three major bits of work and you'll see these focus primarily on nitrogen. And that's because probably wetlands, particularly freshwater wetlands are more effective at nitrogen removal than and possibly pesticides, but the evidence is not really strong there, uh, but nitrogen removal, if goes to kind of the understanding is that not super for pesticides, for sediment removal, because if you, if you put too much sediment into freshwater wetlands, they're in landscapes that they can't just kind of get rid of it, they'll fill up with sediment. So um, not great for sediment removal, but quite good for, for nitrogen removal. So that's the focus we've got here. Next slide. So there's a significant amount of information that has been collected and is available on treatment systems. So we work very closely with DAF and a broad uh, a group of other um, people across the whole of the Great Barrier Reef and elsewhere. And there's a full treatment system toolbox available on Wetland Info of the broad range of treatment systems that are available. If you see the conceptual model over on the right hand side, and that includes information on some of the urban 
um, work that Jamie will be talking about next. There's technical support and advice. DAF runs a community of practice on treatment systems as well. And there are significant amounts of guidelines available to assist people when it comes to water quality improvement using these treatment systems, both in the urban space and in the agricultural space. Next slide. In terms of nitrogen processing, there's a lot of synthesis of information on how wetlands process nitrogen, which is available on Wetland Info. There's another body of additional information that's uh, currently being uh, developed through the consensus statement and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation is doing some work on synthesizing information on wetlands and how they process nitrogen. And there's monitoring that is occurring or just ready to kick off on individual wetlands to conform, confirm the information we have in these conceptual models on how well wetlands process nitrogen in, in the Great Barrier Reef catchments, um, because many of them are a lot wetter than many of the other areas that uh, around the world where uh, this kind of information has been collected. So we have to ensure that the information we have is consistent with the, the wetland types that we've got, but a lot of information already available, not being collected, and then new information is underway as well. When it comes to wetland modelling and conceptual models, we've really had two phases here. Um, there's a whole range of stakeholders um, were involved in helping us develop conceptual models to aid in our understanding of wh how wetlands are represented in models, both at a local and catchment scale. One of the challenges, people like myself, I'm not a modeller, and modelers uh, speak a different language to uh, what I speak and our way of bridging the gap between um, um, my understanding and I suppose a modeler's understanding was to try and develop these conceptual models that actually um, compartmentalize how wetlands process nitrogen at these various different scales. And we already have those that information available now. And there's a second phase, which is building a specific wetland model, a hydrological model for, for uh, nitrogen removal. Um, and that's being done and led by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. So we've gone kind of from that conceptual model stage to building a model that will allow us to be able to predict if you have a wetland in the landscape, how much nitrogen is that wetland removing? Um, so there is a range of different scales of these models. Um, uh, this one here is the site scale. And as you can see, what it has got in it is it's got the inflows that can come in from uh, the landscape or direct uh, uh, um, inputs to the wetland. It then simulates the open water zone, the benthic zone and the vegetation zone with all those biogeochemical processes and incorporates that with hydraulics and hydrology uh, to actually predict um, how much nitrogen is removed by various different wetlands. Uh, we did a big review of wetlands around the world and effectively there was no model that we could use. So uh, this, this model has been developed at the present time, been led by Alluvium. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of both framework information and also specific technical information that relates to um, the integration of the wetland strategy with the review of the water quality improvement, both in terms of whole of system values based thinking and also specifically associated with the aspects of wetlands that do improve water quality. So the hope would be that as we move forward, we get a much closer uh, connection between the Reef 2050 wetland strategy, water quality improvement plan, 
and also a greater link between system resilience and water quality improvement. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, and we'll then zoom into the urban environment. So I'll hand over to Jamie. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Mike. Uh, it's quite a hard act to follow the uh, the little Irish accent in the the pre picture slides, but I'll do my best to keep you uh, focused and interested in this talk. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet uh, and pay respects to elders past and present. So I would just also like to point out too that today we're going to talk about um, the development of the urban land use uh, or water management target under the water quality improvement plan review uh, and I'll be presenting on this uh, in conjunction with my Australian government colleague Meg Harlow today. So firstly um, what do we mean when we, we talk about urban land use? Um, well I guess within um, any local government area, there's a range of land uses. Um, and so you could have uh, local government areas with, with um, quite a bit of agricultural land use, um, conservation areas, um, and also um, very urban areas. But what we're really talking about for urban land use is um, the areas that already are developed for, for housing industry and uh, the, the other areas that are gazetted for that. Um, the development um, for that purpose. Uh, next slide. Um, I guess the, the the main things that we're we're concerned about or focused on uh, for the urban water management target are, are the sorts of um, management issues that are uh, addressed uh, by local governments primarily, uh, particularly in the reef space. So we're uh, we're really focused on. Um, the urban land development itself um, because of the generation of, of uh, sediment runoff that, that, that can happen under that um, that phase. Um, we're also uh, focused on um, stormwater runoff releases uh, and the contaminants that go with it and also um, the releases from sewage treatment plants um, that, uh, that treat wastewater, uh, sewage wastewater. Next slides. So urban land use can generate a whole tale of, of um, pollutant types and, and this can range um, from I guess pharmaceuticals and metals and pesticides, herbicides, um, microplastics etc. Uh, but the ones we're particularly focused on for our urban water management target, sorry back back a bit um, Emily, yep, uh, are fine sediment and nutrients in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus and the reason we're focused on those pollutant types in particular is because uh, we know that um, they're in sufficient quantities uh, out in the reef to, to affect uh, reef uh, ecosystems such as seagrasses and corals. Um, we know when uh, they're generated and how they're generated um, and we know uh, the sorts, and in general terms, particularly for agriculture, the sorts of things we need to do to uh, address um, the, uh, reducing the loads of these things. So essentially, that's what uh, we're really focused on for our urban uh, water management target development. Any activities that uh, you know primarily influence the nutrient and sediment runoff. Next slide. So the reason why we're run, worried about uh, fine sediment runoff in particular is because um, when it's um, you know, generated in sufficient quantity, it it, um, it actually uh, reduces the amount of light in the water column, um, uh, and with that reduced light, um, there's less ability for corals and seagrasses to photosynthesize and produce energy. Um, and so you get reduced growth rates and sometimes reduced health through that. Um, also, if fine sediments are in uh, sufficient quantities and they, they flock out of the water column, um, they could also directly smother uh, seagrass and, and corals as well. Uh, next slide. With regards to nutrients, uh, well, nutrients are essential uh, for uh, like a building block for um, supporting um, plant and, and, and animal um, growth, but 
if you have too much nutrients in the in the in the water, um, you can actually uh, create algal blooms. Um, so these algal blooms can um, basically reduce uh, the amount of light uh, reaching coals and seagrass. So again, can influence photosynthesis rates and growth. Uh, but they can also flock out and and and, and smother seagrass and uh, and corals as well. And the other thing that can happen uh, when there's die off of those algal blooms, we can get other issues such as uh, reduced dissolved oxygen in the in the waterway, which can um, re result in uh, in extreme cases, fish kills and the like. Uh, next slide. So in terms of um, urban land use and the reef catchment, um, that particular land use only covers one percent of the reef, reef catchment area. So very small relative to agriculture. Um, and I guess as a consequence, it's, it was always going to generate uh, less nutrients and sediment runoff than agriculture. Um, but um, I guess because of the hard services in, in urban uh, land use for you know, roads, housing, um, so roofs and things like that, um, the amount of um, pollutants and particularly sediment and nutrients uh, generated per unit area is actually higher than any other uh, land use in the reef catchment. So they've got a disproportionately high um, uh, amount of, of pollutant loads per unit area. Um, so the, the actual contributions uh, of urban land use to uh, reef uh, dissolved in inorganic nitrogen loads is, is, is 7%. And I guess if you, you're looking at the slide there, you can see that uh, our catchment loads modelling indicates that the majority of this is, is coming through stormwater runoff. Um, and uh, it, it contributes around 2% of fine sediment at a reef, reef scale in terms of loads. Um, notably, uh, urban land use can have um, a sig significant uh, local impact or be you know, uh, locally relevant. So uh, I'll give you an example of that. So for the Ross catchment uh, in, in Townsville area, uh, urban land use contributes to 60% of the dissolved inorganic nitrogen loads for that catchment. Uh, next slide. So there's a number of drivers, pressures and challenges um, that affect the outcomes for, for urban water management and, and, and urban water quality. Um, I guess um, somewhat unavoidable uh, are the drivers such as population growth um, and we are in a housing affordability and cost of living um, pressure uh, scenario at the moment. So with population growth, uh, we will be clearing more land. So there's more potential for a sediment and nutrient release uh, through that. And also uh, we're generating more um, sewage. So there'll be higher volumes of, of sewage wastewater to treat and, and consequently um, increase loads. But where the opportunities are to, to really uh, address urban water management uh, are really to um, encourage uh, and build on the, the, the good political uh, will um, to, to address urban water management. And we, we already have uh, 19 Reef Guardian Councils in the reef catchment. And so, uh, and certainly other organisations and individuals that uh, have a really uh, uh, stewardship attitude and, and um, you know, a lot of effort uh, to address urban water management in the reef catchment. Uh, we can focus on building capacity uh, to make sure that uh, the, the people at the, the, the coal phase are, 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 have the appropriate skills and resources to deliver uh, effective urban water management. Um, we can uh, certainly take a more integrated uh, approach to the way that urban water is managed. Uh, and we could also think of ways to, uh, I guess, um, find that balance between addressing hotspot um, issues and addressing um, general issues that occur right across um, the reef catchment in terms of urban water management. Oh, next, next slide. So uh, since the the last release of the Water Quality Improvement Plan, uh, the Australian and Queensland government have, have um, uh, responded to a number of these challenges. So I guess the, the highlights are on this slide. So starting with um, the introduction of the reef regulations, um, which um, 
put a cap on nutrient loads that can be released from sewage treatment plants in the reef catchments. So uh, for any new uh, uh, STPs that are, want to be built or, or any STPs that, that uh, are um, set for an upgrade or an, an enhancement, um, they can only re release um, the the level of nutrients that are under their current license cap and they can't in, you know, introduce any new uh, loads to the reef. Um, uh, we've introduced um, uh, some policies to allow more flexible arrangements to, as to how we, we manage uh, nutrient loads with regards to point sources and, and stormwater. So there's the, the point source offset policy that was introduced in 2019 and, and the, the offsites policy for stormwater also introduced in, in 2019. Uh, we've invested in in trying uh, low cost alternative wastewater management solutions um, to address the uh, I guess the need for uh, more affordable um, alternatives to traditional uh, engineered uh, advanced treatment technologies um, to to make the the costs of of wastewater treatment more sustainable. Um, we've had over a number of years and and still going um, the erosion and sediment control and stormwater management capacity building project delivered by Healthy Land and Water, Water by Design, uh, which is really targeted uh, at, at um, both council staff and, and developer contractors to build uh, their capacity to uh, be more effective in delivering um, air water quality improvement outcomes. Uh, importantly, uh, since 2017, uh, we developed a, a tool for uh, benchmarking urban water management practice in, in the form of the urban water stewardship framework. Uh, and we implemented that for the first time in 2020. Um, it's a, a biennial uh, implementation, uh, and that allows us to give some insights in terms of uh, the level of management practice being applied uh, relative to current best practice. Um, and more recently, uh, both the Queensland Government through Reef Assist and, and the Australian Government through its um, urban waterways improvement um, program have invested in, in urban waterway restoration projects will boost the, um, I guess, the natural um, treatment trains um, such as riparian reef, reef veg uh, to, to uh, reduce nutrients and sediment. Next slide. Uh, I will hand over to my colleague, Meg Harlow, to talk uh, a little bit about the development of the urban water management target. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you all here today virtually from Mianjin or Brisbane to talk to you about the urban water management target. I'd also like to just briefly acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so put simply, the current target is that the management of urban, industrial and public land uses for water quality shows an improving trend. So it's a bit open-ended and it covers aspects other than urban land use. And as we've said, it's being revised as part of the overall WQIP review. Uh, next slide. So as you can see, we have started the target review journey, but we don't have a new proposed target to present here yet. The target development has been guided by independent subject matter experts and stakeholder advice. We began the process to appoint an independent contractor in September 2022, who then led some targeted stakeholder workshops from March last year. This resulted in a draft target option, which we're currently rescoping based on executive and stakeholder feedback. Uh, we're currently on track to have a revised target finalised in time for public consultation on the WQIP, which is scheduled to begin in Feb 2025. So I'll now share some of our current thinking in our considerations in reviewing the target. Firstly is what to focus on. There are many different aspects that could form part of our focus. For example, we need to make sure that our approaches are integrated to provide water quality outcomes for the reef. We also need to ensure that we have the right investments for the challenges. Part of this is considering what we can influence and how we measure success. So the target should be able to be supported by activities that are effective and practical with efficient and effective investment at an appropriate scale. Um, secondly, we need to consider what the destination is. 
the current target's quite open-ended. So if we're going on a journey from A to B, where is B? It needs to be defined, achievable and measurable. Thirdly, we need to look at what to measure and how. Whatever the basis for the target is, we need to have metrics for success and a way of monitoring those metrics. It's much easier to set targets for those aspects that are already established. For example, the urban water stewardship framework that Jamie mentioned, which is used for benchmarking the urban water management practice level. And finally, we need to consider the stage of the journey that we're on. We're only early in our journey of understanding urban water management, so I'll hand back over to Jamie to outline some of the differences compared to our experiences with the agricultural sector. Thank you, Meg. Yes, so we are relative to agricultural land use. We are, we're quite early in an understanding um, of the linkages between, um, I guess, you know, what applying a, a particular management practice at a certain level means for uh, water quality outcomes. So for the agricultural sector, um, there's been many years of, of research, uh, many, uh, or quite a bit of investment in that research to understand what happens if you uh, apply a particular practice at a paddock scale uh, to the, the outcomes for water quality at, you know, when it comes off that paddock and, and, and right through to the catchment scale and the reef scale. Um, for urban water management practices, we don't really have that understanding yet, um, certainly not for those planning um, cycle aspects. Um, we don't have an understanding, for instance, of the the uh, I guess the barriers and motivators for adopting best management practice by uh, councils and the development and construction sector. Um, we need to get more data on that. Um, while we have applied the Urban Water Stewardship Frameworks to, to part of the reef catchment to, to benchmark uh, management practice level, we really don't have to apply it at an appropriate scale to get uh, an understanding of what management practice is uh, at that reef uh, catchment scale. So consequently, uh, we we don't yet know what the ideal range of support solutions to improve urban water management is, um, and we're still defining that. And because of that, um, we have uh, challenges around uh, developing a prescriptive smart based target for for urban water management. Next slide. So while Meg and I don't have a, a draft target option for you for urban water management, we can sh certainly share today uh, for your feedback our current thinking on um, what uh, the urban water management target might look like. So I guess, firstly, our current thinking is that the focus for the urban water uh, management target would be on management practice level. Um, that aligns with the, the current uh, target in, in the WQIP. Uh, it also aligns with the management practice adoption target for the agricultural sector. Uh, we think that uh, management practice level is something that, that we uh, can influence directly, uh, particularly through existing programs and maybe um, other support programs that, that can uh, enhance capacity and, and, uh, and skills, et cetera. And finally, uh, we have the, the toolkit to, to benchmark management practice level. And so that's in the form of the Urban Board Stewardship Framework. And that was developed um, in consultation with, with uh, industry. So we have an agreed um, set of what best management practice is for the, the 66 activities that are covered under the Urban Water Stewardship Framework. Uh, next slide. So in terms of that destination Meg uh, referred to in an early slide, so I guess what we're currently thinking is the target would would uh, speak to uh, um, the proportion of Reef Council's um, achieving best management practice or above would be the destination and we would like to see an uh, increased proportion of councils achieving those levels of practices as we just define them as stewardship practices over time. Um, if we're going to have a, a target such as this, we're going to need to, as I said before, um, benchmark management practice at the appropriate scale. So 
at present, um, we we have assessed 13 councils out of a possible uh, 32 odd uh, in the reef catchment. Um, and so what we really need to have a representative um, sample is to to cover all six NRM regions in, in the reef catchment. We need to uh, make sure that we've, we're covering the majority of reef councils in the catchment and we need to make sure that we cover all the major um, urban centres in the reef catchment, and we're not there yet. And, and this is something we're looking looking to um, to do to to bench, benchmark the the target. Um, we have some really good stakeholder networks to to help um, us pretend, potentially get to that representative benchmarking coverage, such as the Reef Guardian Councils, LGAQ. Queensland Water Directorate, um, Healthy Land and Water, Water by Design. But uh, for any people here that uh, belong to a council that's not in a regional report card partnership region, um, that hasn't undertaken the urban water stewardship framework, uh, we'd, we'd be interested in, in, in seeking your help to help us um, expand uh, our networks and coverage of the urban water stewardship framework assessment. Next slide. So in terms of the target, if you're going to um, progress towards that target, uh, the, we believe um, there's probably going to be a need for, I guess, a strategic uh, urban focused investment strategy that's, um, I guess, across uh, at least the Australian and Queensland governments, if not going down to the next tier. Um, and that would just make it such that uh, you know, we have a shared vision for the priority um, actions in terms of supporting strategies and shared investment and, and, and more more of an integrated response that we, we were seeking. Um, one thing that we're really cognizant of, though, is that, you know, uh, whether or not we, we have that investment strategy in place, uh, the initial investments should, should focus on addressing some of the foundational information gaps that we have, and I referred to them earlier, and also enhance the capacity building programs that we're already doing. Um, and of course, uh, some funding would be needed to expand the geographic rollout of um, our management practice benchmarking tool. So that's our talk on urban today. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand you back to Maria. Thank you very much, Jamie. Meg and Mike for that really informative um, presentation. And I think we spoke in seminar one about the scale that we're um, dealing with. I think from that whole of system, catchment scale, wetland conversation to how do we really focus on the urban environment and where what's A and what's B for the urban sector. Um, so thank you very much for that. I, Emma, if you could please stop the recording and then we can have a chat about